Hey guys, this is Jonathan at Quixel. I'm your friendly local community manager, support lead, and as I mentioned last time, I'm also an artist. And today I'm going to be taking you through part two of developing a scene in Unreal 4. Now this is targeted towards people of varying skill groups. I don't expect this to be the most beginner friendly, but it's also not going to be something that I'll try to skip over. So if you guys have questions, as always, you're always welcome to ask. I will do what I can to get you on air. Um, it's a very hectic show. I have to put a lot of things into 60 minutes, so I'll do what I can. So as always, if you guys have questions, don't hesitate to ask. But that being said, part two. So when we last left off, uh, after we had a break with Jack McKelvey's wonderful Halo Blood Gulch scene, uh, we took a little break after that and then came back to this. And I would like to say that I've been able to get enough done to it to feel really confident in showing it off but it's been super busy lately for me especially with the news that some of you may not know that we joined forces with epic games so everything you're seeing in here currently all these textures and materials this is all free to use if you work with unreal engine so keep that in mind if you guys would like to get started there is no better time than now you can easily get set up with an unreal engine license Go into the uh, Mega Scans library and grab anything that you want to make your own dreams come to life. So no longer is it really like relegated only to the AAA studios. The power is now in your hands. <clears throat> so last time we left off, uh, I had a bunch of oak trees up here. I uh, went into Speed Tree over the weekend and busted out some sable palms. Now these actually use the uh, scans that everybody else who uses the Mega Scans library has access to. And this was fun. Uh, setting each one of these little leaf cards up. Of course, you can't really see it too well the way it's been developed. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 fun. I mean, I, I love coming in here and making these these trees that, that bring the scene to life and really ground it. Um, if you've seen me on Reddit when I'm chatting on, on the Unreal Engine subforum, you'll see, or subreddit rather, you'll see me talking to people and, and mentioning that trees are one of the best ways to ground a scene in reality. It It's one of the, the things that tells humans that there is a scaled object that you can relate to as a person, that you can actually see that this scene has a certain amount of depth and a certain amount of world scale. And without these trees here, it really doesn't sell the illusion to me. Now with this giant ice tree in the center, you have some of that, but I feel with these on top, it really helps you realize that you're in the middle of the scrubland with this kind of hidden underground temple bunker area. So it's to me like ne getting these trees in there was such a huge part of the scene and if i wanted to keep the original look of the scene which i'll bring up momentarily uh i needed to have sable palms in there because that's what i originally made when i first made the scene so let me unlock my pure ref scene and i will pull it over and show you guys so for those of you who missed last week's stream this is what i'm currently rebuilding this was my college capstone project from 2011 I spent the better part of a year working on this. It had animations, it had like a little cheesy fly-through video, um, you know, a full character rigged uh, for animation and everything. But good lord, does it look bad compared to what I'm doing now. Uh, and again, th the reason why I chose to do this project specifically, especially now that, you know, we've come full circle where we're, I'm able to like take the same techniques that I used in, in 2011 where I took pictures of things and, and made a crude photogrammetry scan and then turned those into textures using Endu, uh, I can now just go into our scan library and have the same effect without having to do all that manual work. So uh, the end result is the same. I'm still making these assets in a lot of ways. I'm still working with them. I'm just not spending the time photographing them myself and cutting them out. So ultimately the work is getting done. It's just getting done in a different way. So as you can see, it's been through some major revisions. I took out these pillars. I felt that they were blocking the line of sight. And I, I don't know, maybe I'll put them back. But for now, I think they just, they're too noisy. They just, they don't add anything to the scene. But the palms on top do. It, it does help ground you. It makes you feel like you are underground rather than above ground. And it helps you realize that you are in a specific place in this world that I've created rather than this just being i mean this could be a space station for all you know but with those trees on top it kind of helps ground it like i said so to me that's that's kind of why i brought them back and i spent the time to go into speed tree and make them work uh and that was a fun process to accomplish because speed tree makes it very simple uh, once you've cut out the atlases with whatever your preferred modeling software is you can easily 
take them into speed tree and load them up and apply some textures and then throw those textures on them inside of unreal and you're done it's a very simple process very simple import very simple export so let me uh let me see what's going on in chat and see if anybody has any questions just yet again this is just me today so i will do my best to keep up with chat while i talk i have a i'm very good at talking for a very long time so i have to make sure that i check on you guys and you know make sure you're not getting missed out on here so looks like nobody's asking anything just yet oh well speak of the devil quixel can you make a tutorial on how to create custom characters with animations for a first person shooter unfortunately we cannot that is not something that we are able to do only that we are not character artists here and we are not in the business of making tutorials for like character art but we do plan on making lots of character or um environment tutorials in the future so this is just but one of many things coming along as time progresses uh, you'll see more works in progress from us you'll be able to interact with us directly ask us questions about how all these things are done uh, best practices tips and tricks that sort of thing so uh, if you're looking for character tutorials the best place to look for that kind of thing is google uh, absolutely it's it's an easy place to go to search for these things where you can find references and information from others who have come before to you know if have asked the same questions it, it actually now more than ever is the easiest time to get started with 3d work whether it be making characters or anything else so that being said um so what i did manage to get done actually was the rest of the scene in the couple of weeks it's been since i worked on this with the work we've been doing with epic games recently it has been very hectic to me and i've been trying to keep up with the, the workload and still get my art done on the side and I finally got the entire scene blocked out to a point where I feel confident showing it off. Because I was very not sure if I was going to pull it off in time, but I stayed up really late last night and made sure that I did. And I'm glad that I did because I'm, I'm quite happy with how this turned out. Um, especially these hallways here, because I needed to find a way to differentiate this long stretch from this garden area. And I thought, what better way to do that than to reuse existing assets that I already have and turn them into light sconces? darkly embedded into the ceiling so now you have the same look as the outside with these floating orbs yet they're embedded into the ceiling and they look very much like uh, what's the best place to look? like it almost looks like a museum now and maybe that's not my intent but i do like how it came out so uh, james wants to know can you do a tutorial on optimization within unreal uh that's a really broad question it really depends on what you're trying to do. Like, like what kind of optimization do you want? I mean, if you're looking for optimization for mobile games, optimization for AAA games, optimization for indie games, optimization for the kind of work that I'm doing where everything is lit in real time, it's all fully movable dynamic lighting, yet I'm still getting a consistent 30 frames. Really, it all depends. If you want, if you want to know how I'm managing to keep 30 frames, I'll tell you the easiest way to do that is just to make sure that you have attenuation radius is set up for these lights so that they're not all shooting as far as they can possibly shoot because once they start overlapping to a huge extent and every bit of the scene is covered by every single light you're going to slow to a crawl even with the best machine out there i have a 1080 ti powering this right now and even this is struggling to run at 30 just because of how many lights and how many shadows are being cast all at the same time i mean there's quite a few dynamic lights in here Plus the sun, which is also dynamic. The skylight, which is dynamic with uh, distance, yeah, distance field, ambient occlusion, that sort of thing. So it's it's a it's a complex balancing act to make all this run in real time, and that's a huge part of it for me. As I said in the first stream, was to make sure that I could do this without it being so slow that coming on stream, you guys would be like, "Wow, this really runs bad." Um, so it, it's a balancing act. It takes a lot of time to figure out what settings work, which ones don't. And honestly, the only way to really know what works and what doesn't is to get in there and try it yourself and play with it. And if you want to really know what's going on, you can always hit the, the GPU profiler, which I believe is this. So you should be able to see what's slowing down the scene. So you can see that the, the scene itself is obviously the most intensive part, and you can figure out what or part of the rendering you can, and you can then figure out what is causing most of the slowdown so it looks like a decent amount of time is being spent working on shadows which makes sense considering this is dynamic and it's all trying to split these uh, dynamic shadows up into a bunch of different regions that are eating up vram and processor time on the gpu 
So there's only so much it can render in real time, and you have to find ways to manage that. If you, if you lower the shadow quality on your dynamic lights, you can get more frames, but then again, it looks worse. It's always a trade-off. I like to go for quality, but at the same time, I don't want it to run bad. So let's see. Uh, ex Exitit? Exiled? Did? Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, he wants to know, how do you get tessellation to work with the material in Unreal? That's actually pretty simple. The, uh, the master material that we have from Bridge should automatically set that up. I'm not going to turn it on in here because it's going to kill the frames, but it's a really simple shader setup. Um, you just need to connect a couple of nodes into the displacement, and then you just have a couple of controls that you can parameterize, and then that should allow you to make the walls pop out. I did consider like making it so that the displacement map that I kicked out of Mixer could actually make these little notches pop out of the out of the walls here, but I didn't think it was worth the amount of uh, hassle it would be to the GPU. I would probably get 15 frames doing that. So ultimately, displacement is something I, I recommend if you want super realistic stuff, but if you're trying to run it in real time or near real time, try to avoid it unless you have a beast of a machine. Like if you've got a 2080, yeah, go for it, have fun. Uh, with a 1080 Ti, and everything else I've got here, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would recommend it, unless you're just trying to make single shots and not fly through something and show an audience. Ah, let's see, uh, Awakening Animations. Please explain your setup for the beautiful cinematic look. Maybe a little discussion of your models and how you prepared them. Well, thanks, number one, for the compliment. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's, it's always nice knowing that people appreciate the, the work that I do. Um, and that's not even the cinematic view. This is actually the cinematic view. I've, I've just been flying around with the, the perspective camera. This is the actual camera that I've used for the scene. So to really look at what this scene is going to look like, we need to fly through this camera and have an idea of how it's going to look in the end, which I, I fundamentally love this, but I haven't tweaked it in a bit. So there's some things that I do need to change to make it a bit more, um, maybe a bit more clamped, get some more contrast in there. It's a little washed out in some areas. Uh, ultimately, it's all about, you know, playing, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. So for the models, really, I mean, it's not so much the models that are doing this. It's all of the lighting and post-processing that I've set up. So if you go into the camera details here, you can actually see how I've done this. And I try to tweak everything in the color grading just to, to get to where I want. Um, you can do a lot of that by changing the toe and the slope. You can get varying levels of contrast in there. You can change the shoulder. So that changes the kind of like the, the, the sharpness of the highlights. Um, you can also change the clipping of the black levels. That's a good way to get some really, really sharp, like just juicy contrast, but it's also very easy to overdo, which is why I don't use it much. Um, changing the slope is also another way to do this. You can, you can combine both to get more or less, uh, however you really want to do it. Kind of like that, actually. Um, but I'll leave it where it's at for now. I don't, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this kind of work because then I can spend an entire day talking about proper settings for cameras. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's ultimately what most of this is, is these post-process settings and then changing some ambient occlusion, changing some distance field AO, changing your exposure, depth of field, all sorts of stuff. Everything comes together as a whole in the end. There is no individual parts to this. Like I like to play with the gain, so I like to bring the, the midtones up or down, depending on how much I need it to be. Like if I want this to be a little bit stronger in the midtones, I'll bring that up. If I want some more contrast in that, I'll bring those up as well to kind of like, I really like that actually. Uh, so yeah, as I play with this, sometimes I see things that work and sometimes I th see things that just look objectively awful to me. And then I switch off and I try something else. And if you take anything out of these streams, it should be that trial and error is one of the biggest things you can do as a developer is to try to play with different settings until you find what works for you, uh, for the vision that you have, for the ideas that you're trying to push, for the world you're trying to create. Uh, because ultimately the work that you create as an artist is an expression of yourself and what you want the world to see about what you believe and think. So yeah, most of this, as I said, is all in post-processing. Um, so like if we wanted to play with some other things too, like if you tried the gain and the shadows, you can bring that up so it's not as dark. You can bring it down. So you get, that looks really cool. Actually, let's change that to 0.8. Actually, no, let's try 0.65. There we go. Now you've got defined levels of light and shadow on the walls and there's no more 
crazy bits of like fog everywhere. You still get the, the contribution from the skylights here, these little sconces that I have embedded into the ceiling, but you get more of a focus on the walls and more of a focus on the floor and in the center fountain piece. Uh, fun fact too, this, this piece here, I actually uh, made this from a, um, what do you call it? I used a reference for this. It was like a, a garden fountain. And I just really loved the design and I turned it into like a little magic water fountain. It's got more detail in my model than the actual water fountain does in real life, but it looked pretty similar. And in the original version of this particular fountain too, I was going to try to address it, but I ran out of time. Uh, I wasn't able to get to it in time was this thing actually had water pouring out of it into this uh, pool down here. Now, of course you can barely see the water in the unreal three version and you can kind of see it here, but ultimately like, the decision I made here was that maybe I'll have a glow around it in the Unreal 4 version and then have it actually work with a Niagara particle system where there's like blue droplets of, of glowing water splashing everywhere to kind of give it a, a really nice look. So if, uh, if we get greenlit for part three on this, I will definitely show you guys how that works. I will be spending probably tonight and the better part of this weekend getting that set up. Uh, the scene is almost done. There's not a whole bunch left to do with it except for, again, answering questions that you guys have and just kind of going through the thought process and how this all works. Uh, again, most of this stuff can be set up by bringing it from bridge and then using the live link functionality, which is actually how I've set up a lot of these assets myself. It's just easier to have a one-click export than have to go in and drag and drop stuff into the, uh, the editor and, and whatnot. It's just... Um, what do you call it? It's a quality of life thing. When you, when you have a, a plugin that does a lot of this work for you, it's just much easier to to manage the work. So let's check out chat. Uh, Art Trooper 2, if you guys don't already, can you guys make a complete tutorial from start to finish explaining it for a complete beginner, please? Well, herein lies the problem with that particular question. It's not that we don't want to do that. It's just that there's got to be a point where we, where we start, right? And everybody who says they're a complete be beginner has different perspectives on what a complete beginner is. Are you a complete beginner to 3D modeling? Are you a complete beginner to Unreal? Are you a complete beginner to like just working with computers? Um, the, the merger, or sorry, the, uh, the work that we're doing with Epic right now is best put as something that has gotten the attention of a lot of people. And people from all over the world now are seeing that they can do amazing things with the scan library. Now, if we're going to make a tutorial from start to finish, we need to then figure out how are we going to target that to help you guys out. So we can we can reach people who want to achieve their goals and their dreams. And the easiest way to do that, I guess, would be to do some market research. But since you guys are on stream, I mean, let me know what you want to look at. Because we definitely listen, listen to you guys and we definitely want to see what you think about these things. Um, do you want something targeted at the very beginning? Like how do, how do we get Unreal installed? How do we move on from there? How do we then get assets from Bridge into Unreal? As Bridge pretty much does most of the work for you now, there really isn't much of a need for a tutorial on that. I mean, it's literally just a, you go to Bridge and then you, you just hit the export button once you've got it installed. It, it almost does all the installation for you. Uh, you just hit export, you bring it in and you just then need to know how to work with the assets in Unreal. You just drag and drop most of the time. So it's it's almost becoming to a point where working with this engine is, I, in my own viewpoint, it's almost like playing with Legos. Like when you have prefabricated assets that you can work with, it's not that much different from being on a like a modern production team. Uh, you'll have somebody who spends their entire time building things in the engine that other people have made. like. If I wasn't the only person developing this world and I was on a team, I would probably have been making all the textures in the models. And then there would be a guy who spends his time or her time putting these assets into the engine for me because I would be focused more on the art rather than the construction, which the construction is an art in and to itself. I mean, just because you have prefabricated assets doesn't mean that it doesn't take skill to work with them. So again, it's all about figuring out what we need to target, how we need to work, so it, it's it's a good question, and I want you guys to realize that we are trying to find ways to accommodate everybody. So if you haven't seen a beginner's tutorial yet, don't worry. We are eventually going to get to that. So um, OTX89 wants to know, I'd like to see some of the 
material setups. The basics are fine, but I'd like a breakdown of some of the more advanced blending types. So one of the, the best blending types that I've seen so far comes from Jack McKelvey, and he created this sweet little thing called a um, temporal AA dithering node. Well, I mean, he didn't make the node itself, but he uses it, and he got me into it, and now I've adapted my materials to use it. So what I'll do is the easiest way to figure this out and where it's at is to go to the details panel. Let's bring all this stuff up. Click that. There we go. And then, oh, it's under my materials. Never mind. I'm trying to remember where all this stuff is. When I get on stream, sometimes things get a little crazy. So under the master environment material that I've built, this is different than our bridge shader. Um, and again, if you guys want this material, let me know on the, the art community, which is found via facebook.com slash groups slash quixel tools group uh, but if you guys want this material let me know i i have so much stuff on my plate sometimes i forget but right now the easiest way to set up a blend between two different objects to get a nice sweet like dithering effect where they kind of blend into each other is this you take a dither temporal aa node so you can just right click type dither it will pop up it will then you can just select it and then you can just drag it in or whatever you want to do you can create a parameter, which is very simple by holding S and clicking. Well, again, looks like I typed like a snake. <laughs> you can just type dither amount, whatever you want to call it, give it a, a starting value. Generally speaking, one is good. You then plug that into a multiply, which can be done by holding M and then clicking. And then these constants can just be created by pressing one. And the constant is no different than this. It just has a name because this is a parameter and this is a static value. And there's a switch here. Uh, the switch isn't always something that you want to put in, but I did because some materials don't need blending. So you can just type switch para when you right click and then click on that and you can call it whatever you want. And then you can just drag and drop these connections directly into it. So if it's true, then it will dither temporal AA along the edges of the model. If it's false, then it won't. So by default, I have it set up to be false, which is what that means right there. And then when you go in engine, what you end up with is the ability to blend these particular assets together in a very, uh, what's the best way to put it? It's, it's best to show you. Uh, it almost looks like the dissolve blend in Photoshop. So if you've ever used Photoshop before, you know what that's like. I believe this asset here is using it. I made a quick transition here to try to make it work. So let's see here. If we open up the material for this, Let's get out of the camera view so it'll be a little easier to see what's going on. And we'll go into unlit mode. Now, right now, you see there's a hard edge transition here. Okay. So, right now, I've got dither edges turned off. So, if you go to this material, you'll see that this is currently turned off. And that was in the master that you just saw. All right. So, I'm going to click it off screen and turn it on. Now, do you see the blending here? Okay. Now, this is controlled by the, what do you call it, the um, dither amount that I had told you about, the static parameter. So you can actually change how far that blends. And you see how it just dissolves like a standard Photoshop blend. So it looks ugly up close. I mean, I'm not going to tell you it looks great. It doesn't. But it's not meant to be looked at like that close. It's meant to be looked at right there. You see how well that looks from a distance? Uh, it looks really good. I mean, even with, um, even with lighting turned on, or with lighting turned on at all, and being out of unlit mode, the transition is so soft, it's very hard to tell that it's dissolving. So it looks really good and it works really well. And the blending mode kind of just helps sell the illusion that these, like, it makes it look like I actually cut this out to match the shape of the walls when I really just shoved it in there. Because I had, I forgot that I didn't do it right before the stream and I'd been meaning to put some kind of transition there the entire week. And then I just kept putting it off to work on other stuff. And then I looked down and I'm like, oh man. This transition looks really bad. Maybe I shouldn't show this on stream. And then I'm like, no, 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 wait, I can just take this piece on the side and use that as a trim. So that 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 kind of like ties into other things you guys can do too. Don't be afraid to reuse assets uh, when you're working in scenes like this. Like it, it, you wouldn't believe how much stuff I've reused here. Like these wall sconces are literally just the, the floating lamps that have been shoved up into the ceiling. I mean, you can't tell. And I mean, I can't tell, honestly. I mean, all I had to do is move the uh, the sphere inside of it up and then just change the material for the sphere a little bit so that the 3D ball inside of it is actually, like, inset a bit. So it actually looks like a light bulb in there or some kind of magic bulb of some sort rather than where it was before. Because when you rotate these things upside down, uh, what ends up happening is the material stays put so that light always stays exactly where it's at. And this rotates. And then you can only see it if you're, like, 
way underneath there. So it looks kind of silly. And with that bulb being so far out, it just looks really gross. So, and of course the ceiling stretching is there too because this is one texture. So I try not to highlight that. I've, I've made it so the light and shadow hides that. Again, this stuff is never meant to be perfect. It's all meant to be looked at from a distance. Um, if you got up really close to these textures, you'd realize this is a 4K texture that's huge on the walls. But I've tried to blend these textures so that it's one map across the whole thing and tried to downplay the this area here so that you can't see the ceiling so much as you can in the outside area because the transition here is not as, as sharp. So it still looks great out here, but when you get into here, there's so much shadow on the ceiling that it's not as noticeable. So let's see. Uh, Alex wants to know, I'm a beginner. How do you use materials from Bridge and Unreal? For example, I want to paint some landscapes and I don't know how, and I didn't find any tutorials from Bridge. That would be because we don't have a landscape material from Bridge right now. But... Um, if you, I can't drop the link in right now because I'm in the middle of the stream, but if you go to Google right now and literally type in uh, Florida Wilderness Unreal 4, you will find an article on 80 level that I wrote. And it, inside of that article, it will tell you how to work with a landscape shader that I built for Mega Scans back in 2016. I know we are eventually going to include a landscape shader at some point for Bridge. And it's just one of those things that it's just, there's technical hurdles involved, so we haven't had a chance to get it done yet. But hang on, guys. We'll get there. What's going on, though, with, with this, this link that I told you guys to check out? If you go there, you can grab the material in it. You can take the, the U asset, drop that into your content library. Not inside of Unreal itself. You actually have to drop it into the, the, um, the Windows directory for that content library. So in, inside of your project's content folder, you need to drop that material into it. You then load it up, and it will look like this. Uh, let me load the material for you guys so you understand what I'm talking about. So if you go to materials and then you go to master terrain, you'll see what looks like a gigantic bowl of white spaghetti. Okay. And this is way less complex than it looks. It's just this thing here being repeated over and over because each one of these nodes has to be like, it's, it's just the same setup. So like layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four is the same exact thing copied and pasted over and over. And then you just, when you load this into your scene, uh, what you do is you open up the material and then you just change each one of these textures so that they actually have an assignment because otherwise they'll come in blank and then you can't use the material. So just make sure you do that, set it up, and then when you go to apply it on a terrain, it's like super simple. You just have to, you go to set up like the landscape paint and when you do that, like, you I, I just press shift three inside of the editor. It's the fastest way to do it. And then you go into paint here and then you have all these layers that are already set up. Um, but of course I have to actually select the terrain for it to show up or maybe I didn't, what did I do with this terrain? I'm pretty sure I had it set up. I haven't checked the terrain in a while. So it actually is there, it's just not picking it up. So maybe I didn't try painting on this yet, which is fine, but I'm, I'm loath to do that because it's compiling shaders right now. So if I do anything with it, it might freeze Unreal for a little bit. So we'll just kind of like, I'll gloss over what you need to do real quick. You just like literally just go into paint, uh, assume these all have textures in them. If they don't, you just hit the create layer info for each one of these. And then you just literally just hit enter each time. And once all of the layer infos are created, you can then select the layer you want to paint with and just paint directly on the terrain. And it will probably compile shaders every time you do it. It takes about 20 seconds. If you have a fast CPU, it'll be even faster. And then you can just blend. And for me, I didn't really need a blend for this particular scene because I have so many plants. You can't, you can barely see the dirt. So it works for me. But on other scenes that I've made, I use the same material that I made in 2016 because I just it works well enough for the purposes that I use it for. You can find much more detailed ones out there. I think the one that we're going to eventually make, I can't be specific on it because we have, you know, I can't promise things on stream. It's what I'm trying to get at. But we will try to make something that is as user friendly as possible that you guys can work with for a variety of applications. So, uh, but we want it to be beginner friendly. So it's not probably not going to be the most advanced thing out there. So what I made is it might actually be pretty similar to it where it's just a basic blend mode with height blending. So like there's a, a clamped alpha texture in the Albedo map that just drives the textures blending together. And it just looks really cool. You have to do some manual work to make it work out. You'll have to go in there and paint it out and maybe use different blending like types in the landscape shader, but it will work and it will look cool if you put the time into it. All right, uh, let's see. Noah wants to know, on the trees, did you use planes and Unreal or another model software? 
These are, uh, you must have missed the beginning of the stream. I'll go over it again real quick. These trees are done in SpeedTree. Uh, they are, they make an amazing package for this kind of work. Megascans works with it fluidly. It's very simple and intuitive. Uh, one of these days we might end up actually doing a tutorial on that. I can't promise anything there, but I would like to because it is such an easy program to use and pick up. Um, I mean, honestly, all it takes is some experimentation. You get in there and just play with things. If it doesn't look right, keep messing with it until it does. It, it doesn't take that much effort. SpeedTree does most of the work for you. The rest of it is just you directing it to do what you want it to do. Let's see, any other questions you guys have? Uh, let's see, can you turn on wireframe? so we can see what it looks like. I can do that, but I'm going to let you know that Unreal's wireframe is very hard to understand if you're not used to looking at it. So here it is. You're going to see particles flowing around from the fog. You're going to see the individual trees. You're going to see bushes and plants, and you will see the sky blocker that I have on the outside here too. Um, that's something I haven't covered yet, and I don't think we've, we don't really talk about this much on stream, so I'll cover it now. Uh, but if you don't have this sky blocker, watch what happens. If I hide it, that's what happens. Because the sun is over here, it actually shoots through the back faces of these walls. Now, I could probably get around that by setting these to be back faced. But I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of old school, so I use a sky blocker instead. So the sky blocker essentially acts as a shadow blocker. So the, the sun hits this and then prevents it from casting light over here. So that's a huge part of the scene. Uh, without that, you're going to have weird shadows coming from the wrong direction and you know can't have that it, it it destroys the entire like ambience that i'm going for i do have kind of a similar setup with these palms and these uh fronds and whatnot up here too if i took most of them out the opacity of these would actually start hitting like like you actually start seeing through them right here on the edges rather than back here so i could use that to create dramatic effect if i want so let me uh go into the foliage painter and actually turn off all my plants and then turn it back on so that I can only select the palms that I want to work with. Let's see, there's this one, that one, that one, and that one. Okay, so I can change the brush size to maybe 150 so you guys can kind of see how this works. So you'll see as I start cutting this out, you see how this, the light starts hitting closer and closer to the edges here? It's subtle, but a lot of these, yeah, there it is right there. The, the shadows in the back are being culled, essentially. So this is allowing the sunlight to hit almost to the edges here, which can create a really cool effect. But ultimately, I'm trying to use some of these plants to block light, so I don't want all of them to be perfectly lit from the edges. Sometimes I want them to be dark, but I think in this case, it actually adds some, some neat effects because these plants use a subsurface scattering material. And as the light hits them, because they're thin, the material in the Megascans shader actually, you know, you can actually see the light coming through, which is really cool. Uh, it's, it's an amazing effect. I think we had that back in UDK, but it was nowhere near as sophisticated as, as it is now. Uh, this is a really, really nice effect, and I use it on all the plants pretty much everywhere, which is why you see these palms are here being lit from behind rather than being in shadow. Because they're thin, they shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be blocking light if they're set up correctly. Deformance wants to know, is Megascans also compatible with tools like Lumion? If it is PBR compliant, Megascans will work with it. You may have to do some manual labor to make it work if we don't have a, a live link for it, but I assure you, if it renders PBR, it's going to render Megascans. Let's see. Any other questions you guys have? So far, it looks like... Uh, Looks like I've answered everything. So yeah, let me go into this room here. So one of the things I may have mentioned before in other streams is that I like to work with what I call prefabs. Now this is a holdout from the days of Unreal 3 on UDK, whatever you want to call it. I learned UDK when I was in college and I loved it. I mean, it's it's been the most powerful user experience I've ever had. And I work with Unreal almost exclusively for everything that I make just because I'm used to it now and it produces the highest level of visual fidelity for me within the work that I'm trying to do. So one of those things that really helps me get to my, my next level here is working with what I, like I, again, prefabs, right? And these are essentially blueprints. They're collections of C++ code. So it's just code telling you that these meshes are combined. Okay, so this is actually a pot from the latest, uh, what do you call it, Megascans drop that happened today. And, and my wife was actually looking at this last night and she's like, you know, this area needs some flower pots. 
And I'm like, I don't know. Does it really? And she's like, yeah, I think it does. So, you know, I saw flower pots this morning, and it must be somebody, like, you know, up there listening at the scan headquarters because they realized, hey, this guy needs pots. Let's go make some pots. So here I go. I got some pots. Now, what I did here is I created a prefab for this so that I don't have to mess with the plant every single time. So when you go into here and you look at the viewport, it's all these things together, right? So you have the pot, you have a sphere to give it dirt because the pot does not actually come with dirt. It's just a pot. And then you have the plant, okay? This is fun because I just applied a Megascan's texture to a sphere that I flattened. So like this is like literally all I did. I mean, I, I try to use whatever workarounds I can. If I don't have to make something myself by hand, I'm, I'm just not going to. It's not that I'm lazy. It's just It's just faster sometimes to not worry about it. So if I had to set this back to the scale that it was, this is what it was. It was literally just a sphere that I've flattened and just kind of squished in place. Looks more like a pancake now. But the cool thing about it too is I can actually come in here and adjust this. So if I want more dirt or less dirt, or if I want it to be more built up and moundy looking, I can do a bunch of things. It, it gives me the ability to control all that and I don't have to actually uh, mess with any of the, the modeling packages. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know, speaking of which, Unreal 4.24 Preview has the ability, from what I've heard and seen, to actually do some at least basic modeling work inside of it. So who knows? Maybe we'll start like modeling inside of Unreal soon. It's going to be your one-stop shop for everything these days. I, I love it. If I didn't have to leave Unreal, I probably wouldn't, to be honest with you. So let's see. Um... Alex Redkin, I go to the Terrain Master and there is something called RMA. What is that? That is a channel packed texture. I guess uh, for those of you guys who are new and don't know what a channel packed texture is, I will tell you. Channel packed textures are first and foremost awesome. They are one of the easiest ways to work with a texture. It is one texture that you that actually works as three separate ones. So this export from Mixer that I made, this is the walls by the way. So if you go here, and you look, like, this is the wall, all right? Now you can see the, the, the way I've set it up. I set it up in the trim. So you have a trim segment up here, you have a trim segment down here, and then you have the main wall, all right? Now, what this is, is it is three different textures combined into three different channels. So I've set this up in a manner most people seem to be using it these days, which is roughness, metalness, ambient occlusion, right? But I put my roughness in the green channel because as I've read personally, the green channel is actually the most, like, the least compressed. So I want the most detail in my roughness channel. I'm gonna use it in the green channel. So this is the roughness map. So for those of you guys who don't know what a roughness map is for the absolute beginners, the darker areas define areas of shininess or smoothness. The whiter areas define areas of roughness or matte. So the, the whiter it is, the less it reflects light. The smoother it is, the darker it is, the more it reflects light. So these silver trim pieces with this um, stylized white texture that I put on it help kind of like sell the illusion that this is made out of metal, but it also, because it's using a metalness texture in the blue channel, you can kind of, ooh, that's interesting. I didn't realize I made these things metal too. That's kind of cool. Um, but anyway, like the blue channel is for metalness and the way I've set it up. So white is metal, black is not. And the red channel is for occlusion. So if there was any occlusion, which there is, that is then driven by the red channel. And if you want to see how that's set up, the easiest way to look it up is to go into the master material and it will show you how to work with it. So if you go to the master environment that I've built, and again, this is all done for you with the uh, Megascan shader, but this is my personal one that I like to use because I'm finicky and like to do things my way. Um, you'll see that the Albedo map feeds off into the output Albedo. I know I'm speeding through this, but trust me, most of this stuff you don't need to see. Uh, give Unreal a second to, uh, there it goes. The RMA, red is the AO, so that feeds down into a switch called no ambient occlusion. If it's true, there is no AO and it's pure white, which is one. If it's false, which is default, the AO map is spit out, okay? green goes into the no RMA pack. So if it's RMA packed, then I have it set up so that this RMA texture will only use the green channel. Okay, so it's generally speaking set to false always, which is what that false means. If it's set to true, in the case that I'm using a single roughness texture, 
Uh, I always I just have it set to do RGB. I could probably just set it to the green too. It probably wouldn't even matter, but I'm just weird like that. I have these two controllers set up to emulate a Photoshop levels blend. So levels is controlled by power and strength is controlled by multiply. So this is basically like clamping these values if I really want to get some nice effects out of it. And that outputs in the roughness. And then the metalness kind of flops on down to here. And if there's no metalness, it is set to zero. If it's metalness, then it's driven by the blue channel, which is then spit out into the output metallic. Now, if you go back to the master environment shader, you'll see that what I just opened up, this primary texture input, all this stuff is combined within this. This is called a material function. So it's basically a material that you write that can be used within another material. Uh, that's the easiest way to put it. It's probably not the technically correct way to put it, but that is how I understand it. If I am wrong, feel free to point that out. I will learn. Uh, that being said, this material has a bunch of different stuff that you know I use for emissive controls and whatnot. And sometimes I like to have the AO map control like the albedo map. So sometimes I'll actually overlay the AO over the albedo. And that's what this does. So if you look in here, you'll see that if I want the AO map to control it, I have the ability to have it multiply over the albedo. That's another material function. It's not necessary. It's just something I like to do. Uh, don't feel pressured to use anything in here. You guys are more than welcome to experiment. There's more than one way to texture a cat. So, yeah. Uh, time is flying by. I swear when I do these streams, they, they just... I feel like I just started five minutes ago and I look down and 40 minutes have passed. It's crazy. So, let's see what's going on in, in chat here. So, Brian Lelou, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm sorry. I know I met you at GDC and you're a cool guy. Um, the green channel has one extra bit. It is 565 for RGB and DXT1 compressed textures. The one bit isn't super noticeable in my experience, though. So uh, there you go. From a technical artist, it is the best way to do it, but it may not even be noticeable. So it, it just do what works. If you like your roughness being packed in blue or red, go with whatever works. Let's see. Hmm. What else can we talk about while we're in here? So let's, let's go back to composition. I'm going to go pull up a camera again. And I'll show you guys some of my thought process on this stuff. Now, normally, uh, for those of you guys who love talking about cameras or working with cameras, I'm one of them. I, I don't want to, like, you know, shill for my favorite camera brand. But I've been using Olympus cameras since I was a kid. And I'm just the kind of person that sticks with one brand until I, it just doesn't work for me anymore. So... Uh, for this particular setup, I normally would use the Micro Four Thirds film back, which, for those of you guys who don't know anything about cameras, the focal length is doubled in Micro Four Thirds. You'll, you'll see exactly what's happening here in a second. So I'm in full frame DSLR, so this is basically generic DSLR settings. So the, the frame of view you're seeing right here is what a gener generic DSLR would see, right? So what we have is the ability to check out the focal length and everything. So the current focal length is 35 millimeters. So this is 35 millimeters. This is a standard camera lens. This is what most cameras look or see when they shoot. This is what most people use. 35 is just the gold standard. It's kind of like kind of close to your eyesight, but kind of not. It works pretty well. But if you want to work with micro four thirds, which is what I do, you need to change that. So you have to go in and realize that because that focal length is doubled, this is going to be a 70 millimeter lens in just a moment. See the difference? I don't understand the mathematics behind it. There is some complex photography mathematics that goes into how this works. But to get back to 17.5 or to 35 millimeters, you have to half that. So 35 divided by two is 17.5. Now you have 35 millimeters. And you'll see the, the shot is cropped a little bit more than it was a moment ago. So as I go back and change it back to full frame, you see how this shot changes completely? I did full frame on this one. Normally I would do micro four thirds, but this time around I felt that full frame captures most of the scene in a way that doesn't work with micro. So I didn't use micro. For Again, this is like super photography geeking right now. So for those of you guys, you know, if you're not interested, I'm sorry, but I try to cover everything I can. Um, but ultimately, like, micro is my go-to. Most of my scenes have been shot in micro. My train was done in micro. Uh, the Hall of Oaks that you guys saw a few weeks back, that was done in micro. But this one is the only one that is so wide, and there's so much to the scene to capture that I didn't feel like I could do it justice with micro. So I switched back to the standard DSLR frames. And I think it was a good decision to make. 
Um, real quick, uh, I don't even... Uh, Spartano, I'll call him that. Is ray tracing activated? It is not. I have a 1080 Ti. I wouldn't be able to run date uh, ray tracing even if I wanted to. Uh, without ray tracing, I'm getting 30 frames. It's just not going to happen on this scene. But anyway, so let's look at some camera settings. For those of you guys who like photography, maybe don't understand a lot of the specifics behind it, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do in the engine that emulates real-world cameras. So let's try setting this to something more uh, like photography like right so like let's let's get a shot here we have like like one of those crazy oh my god look at this scene I'm, I'm a I'm a super pro depth of field guy so I'm gonna come in here and set this up to work like that and the way to get depth of field for those of you guys who want to know it's a multiplier of aperture versus focal length so the higher your aperture the more sharp your image is going to be and it also means the less light comes in too but i don't have the the engine set up right now to emulate a camera and the way cameras look at the world i just have it set up to just show everything through the camera lens so it's not actually picking up the exposure settings that would be changed by the aperture going down normally with a camera when you set the aperture down the brightness goes up and you have to reduce your shutter speed but we're not even messing with shutter speeds or anything in here we're just using aperture to control depth of field so the wider your or sorry the the more narrow your aperture and the larger the aperture which is right now it's f22 if you change that to as low as it goes say 2.4 see how blurred out that gets in the background okay so to get even more depth of field from this scene, for those of you guys who want to know how to really get depth of field, the easiest way to do it is to jack up your focal length. So we are still currently at 35 millimeters, as I recall. So for a good, really good level of depth of field, like you want to really push those those um, those details, get those highlights coming out of the, the DOF, here's how you do it. Set your focal length to something like 150, so you have a telephoto lens, okay? Look at that. Look at those. Look at it all blow out. Like those, um, what do you call it? The, uh, there's a term for the, the way those look. And I can see the, the particle is not getting hit. Don't worry. We'll fix that some other time. There's a term for that. It's bokeh. That's what it is. So to change that, to get the bokeh to be under control, you need to change your focal distance here. So as I'm pulling everything into focus, you will see that I got those sweet reflective bokehs in the background. I mean, look at that. Doesn't that look awesome? I love photography, man. It's like my second passion besides 3D art. And I've got a giant lens that I use for this stuff at home. I've got a an Olympus 300 millimeter lens that goes on my four thirds camera. And because it's four thirds, it is 600 millimeters. So actually let me show you what that looks like uh, for those of you guys who are interested to see what a true 600 millimeter looks like. Like when I go uh, take pictures of airplanes and I'm, I'm loath to say shooting airplanes with my camera because the government might be listening. Uh, I would like to say that I take <laughs> I take pictures with the this thing set to 600 millimeters to get some really good shots and the DOF is insane. It looks amazing. So to replicate that, if you go to Micro Four Thirds, all right, you got that set there. So this is now using my Olympus settings, and then we change the focal length from 150 to 300. Now we have a 600 millimeter camera. So it's getting so crazy and hard to control because it's zoomed in so much that the only way to get around that is well, first I need to deselect it. So once Unreal catches up, there we go. So pull this back. Oh, that actually, I pulled the center instead of the, the handle. There we go. All right. So probably not going to be able to pull it far enough away with the way I've currently got it set up. So let's change the focus distance to 2,500 and hopefully we hit it right. Or even better, we can just sample it from the scene. So we come in here, hit this, and there. Now you've got what it looks like from the camera that I actually use at home. Um, some of this is a little wonky looking because it's it starts flattening out in the engine. So I wouldn't recommend using something this, this extreme, but 150 works pretty well for most stuff. And you get a nice bit of perspective here that you can't get without a telephoto lens. So for those of you guys who wanna know how to make really cool DOF shots, that's how you do it with the current version of Unreal. You set up a cinematic camera, you go into the cinematic camera settings and then you change the focus distance and you increase your focal length and then you bring your aperture up. I, I know it sounds weird. I know it sounds weird. To bring your aperture up doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? But like, because what's going on, right? When, when, you, when, you, when you change your aperture, like when you make it small, the number goes up. When you make it large, the number goes down. It is 
I don't understand it. I'm not a I'm not a photography mathematics guy. I just know it looks cool and what works well. Um, so yeah, this is also destroying my machine because it's rendering everything all at once. But uh, the, the end result is so cool. So yeah, don't don't be afraid to play with these settings, guys. Like the cameras are in here to play with. You can you can't even make mistakes. I mean, if you do, all you have to do is hit Control Z and undo. It's not like when I went to the airport the other week and I took pictures and I kept missing every one of my shots as the plane's landing because I couldn't keep it in frame. Like I can't hit Control Z then. I have to go home and delete the pictures. But at least here, if I mess up my shots, I can just kind of change the uh, the viewpoint and mess with it until I get it to be what I want. So you guys have pretty much unlimited creativity here, and you can do almost anything you want. I mean, look at how cool that looks. I really love how this is all coming together. And that's just from changing around some camera settings and keeping, like, a focus on good photography sense in, you know, proper exposure settings. Of course, it's because it's like a telephoto, it's super hard to, like, look around. I feel like I'm a sniper in uh, CSGO right now. There we go. So, you know, if I want to play with, like, different uh, framing techniques, I can actually come in here and change. There should be the ability to show a, um, what do you call it? Oh, here it is. That's what I'm looking for. So you can actually show, like, a, um, a grid so you can frame these shots better. So if I come in here and I want this to be, like, kind of centered towards the bottom right, if I want it to be dead center, this area, or, you know, like this, you can get a bunch of these nice photographic shots just by messing with the grid and seeing how to frame them. There was one point where I could have sworn it had the um, the spiral. I can't remember the name for it. The Fibonacci spiral. That's it. So maybe that was taken out. I don't know. I'm, I'm just imagining things. That could be it too. But there's a bunch of different ways to play with these things and get a really cool effect. And another fun fact too, if you're a photography buff like me and you really want to play with a specific lens, you can actually see what it's going to look like in real, or at least get an, a simulation of what it's like in real life by going to the manufacturer's website like when i want to try out the olympus 45 millimeter camera um or camera lens like i didn't want to spend 200 bucks just to try it out so on my train scene what i did was i took one of these cameras so we'll just grab this one and make a duplicate of it all right and then we'll change this back to four thirds well actually what it is there so let's change this to 45 millimeters all right come in here and now this is a effectively now a 90 millimeter lens so now I can see what the world's going to look like through an Olympus 45 millimeter lens without having to go to eBay or Olympus.com and buy the lens. So if you like a Canon lens or a Nikon lens or whatever lens that you prefer to work with, you can actually go to the manufacturer's site, plug in the details into the cinematic camera and play with the focus settings and see what it's going to work like. It's super cool that you can actually do that uh, because when I was younger, I looked at lenses and I'm like, I just hope for the best. I was like, oh, I hope this lens is going to work. I, gee, I'm only spending $300 on it. But now you, uh, you, know, you actually get a, an idea of what it's going to work like, what it's going to look like in the end, how it's going to feel when you're trying to move it around, uh, especially like you know, the, the, the lenses with a huge focal length like that. Like you saw how hard it was for me to even like move the mouse to keep it stable. Imagine doing that with your hands. Uh, you would need a tripod. Unfortunately, there's no ability to put a tripod in Unreal, so I'd have to like uh, set my mouse to uh, have like that little like sniper button on the side where it lowers a DPI like crazy so I can just like move a, a pixel at a time. So for those of you guys who are photography buffs, like as we're closing up, that's something to keep in mind too. You can actually play with lenses in Unreal and you can really get an idea of what you're going to buy. Or if you just want to have, if you just want to say I used it with a specific lens setting, it's just to, you know, show off your photography knowledge, that's a way to do it too. So, um, let's see. Spartano wants to know, is the streaming going to be available at the end? Yeah, of course. We always uh, put these up at the end. There's no reason not to. Uh, it's actually where we get most of our audience. We get a, a lot of people watching now, but we also get a lot of people afterward too. So we, we keep everything up for years. Uh, you'll come back and I'll, I'll look at this 10 years from now and probably wonder uh, what it was that I was doing at this point and wonder like, wow, why didn't I use Unreal 10? or whatever version of Unreal's app at that point. So, first last wants to know, can you import 3D assets directly from Megascans yet? Or would I have to use my own 3D plugin with the Datasmith exporter? That's a question that I do not know off the top of my head. I think Datasmith is getting deprecated. 
so as far as i know those features are being rolled into unreal coming up by itself like it's just going to be part of the engine you don't have to be part of unreal studio anymore i don't want to talk authoritatively on that because i don't know all the details and i'm very loath to talk about anything if i don't know what i'm talking about uh, i learned that when i was young trust me <laughs> life's easier that way so uh it can't be much help there but i mean i would check into the data smith uh, blog announcement post that Epic made for some details there. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you can make Megascans work with Datasmith, but it might take some tweaking on your end. Let's see, any other questions? Any other questions? Oh, statements, actually. Uh, Chiron says that you can do ray tracing on a 1080 Ti. There's a trick to it, however, and it doesn't always work. That's kind of why I don't want to show that off. Um, I'm already having a hard time with my frame rate as it is, uh, with how much detail I like to put into these things with dynamic lighting. I feel that to really give you guys a good stream experience, I need to be focused on performance and not just entirely on how cool something looks. Because if this runs at 10 frames or 5 frames, it's going to be really choppy. And, you know, that gets kind of old to watch after a while, I think. Uh, I don't want to keep it at a consistent 60. That's that's crazy. But consistent 30 for a personal art project, I think it's a pretty good target. I mean, that's that's mostly optimized. I mean, hell, I mean, a lot of uh, console games run at 30. So really, it's not that bad. Let's see. Anything else today? So we have four minutes left in the show. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for coming on again to, to you know, observe the stuff. You know, I kind of feel like I'm sharing part of my life with you guys because this scene was something that I built in college. Uh, I wish I'd had more time back then to work on it. And I wish I'd had a lot more skill and paid more attention in school and was more focused on making better art than I was in like just trying to get through my classes. Um, but I'm very happy that I'm able to come back now and revisit something and make it look as cool as I knew it could if I had put the effort into it. So again, like I tell you guys this every time we stream, um, it's a consistent point that I feel like I have to make. It's that more than ever, but right now that you guys can make everything you're seeing here. Mixer allows you to make these awesome textures by blending together different procedural patterns and shapes. Uh, you can take Mixer and do almost anything you want with it these days. It's, it's crazy powerful. Um, you know, the Megascans library is open to you now 100% free if you work with an Unreal Engine as your output. Uh, you guys can take all the scans out of it, out of the library, tweak them, mess with them, make them look as amazing as you know you can do. Uh, if you ever want help, we're always around. I mean, my job every day is to chat with you guys and help you out and make sure you're happy. So, I mean, if you need something, reach out. Come to our Discord server. Uh, I'm sure one of our friendly colleagues will happily oblige and place the link in chat momentarily. The um, you can always come to our official forum, which you can find from quixel.com. You can post in our art community, which is facebook.com slash groups slash quixel tools group. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And like I said, if I can do this, guys, you can too. I'm, you know, I'm an artist. I've been doing this for years. I've been working with 3D since 2001. And trust me, you don't want to see what my old work looked like. It's, it's bad. <laughs> but if we all come from somewhere. We all start from somewhere. Our journeys are all basically you know they're different but they're very much the same we all learn we all grow somebody teaches us we teach someone else we leave a legacy for others based on the the deeds that we do and, and how we help others so like i'm i'm here anytime you guys need to chat if you need help with unreal feel free to reach out on our forums and, and community uh before i wrap up though i have another question real quick from let's see andrea mazone what is the most important part you recommend to focus on when creating a scene like this design creativity light etc so i'm not gonna pretend to say that i know exactly what i was thinking when i first made this scene but i started out an illustrator with this i i'm not even joking the entire scene top down this was all traced from illustrator and then i took this from illustrator thinking that i had a nice curvature design with a cool crescent moon at the end and if you had noticed there's a crescent moon motif throughout this entire project um, I ended it with that and then I traced over the geo inside of 3d studio max and then built that into walls and then realized that it wasn't detailed enough for the new version that I'm making so I went back and updated it some more and I took it from this or sorry let me, let me go back to what do you call it uh, my pure ref scene I went from this and i brought it to this and i feel like i've really made a huge improvement over the original work i feel like i've i've done 
a massive amount of work to overhaul it and get it to where I want it to be. And the design inspiration came from working in Illustrator. It was just a one-off idea that I had where I was thinking, man, I could probably make something cool if I started with a 2D shape and just traced over it and made it look like physical geometry, but just envisioned from above. And I could have done the same thing in Max. I could have just traced a spline with Max and built a wall from that. And actually, I'm pretty sure that's how I did it 10 years ago. So ultimately, there's, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to go about this. Like I said, there's thousands of ways to, to texture a cat. It really doesn't matter how you get to it. It's all about what you want to do, what ideas you have to think about, what what drives you, what makes you want to do this work. Find what makes you want to work and hold on to that and make it happen. That is the best advice I can give in this stream today is that the reason why I did this is because I wanted to do it. I wanted to say I can make my old work look better. I can make my work look as good as I want it to look. There is nothing holding me back other than my own ambition. So uh, with that, I'm going to sign off again, guys. Don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. We love chatting with you. You guys are awesome. We do everything that we do to make sure you guys are happy. So we will be back next Friday, as we always are. However, it is getting closer to the holidays. So for those of you who are in the U.S., I want to wish you guys a pre-happy Thanksgiving because 